All right, hello everybody and welcome to the Ocean County Historical Society. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good icebreaker. Uh, my name is Melissa Ziobro, and I'm the Specialist Professor of Public History at Monmouth University. Uh, but more importantly, I'm a trustee of the Ocean County Historical Society and a member of our programs committee. So on behalf of the Historical Society, welcome. Um, I'd also like to thank the other members of our programs committee, Barbara Roish and Richard and Mickey Kunz takes a lot of volunteer effort to pull these events together. So um, we are grateful for the work that all of our volunteers do as we execute our mission telling the stories of Ocean County. Today's program, as you know, is composting in Ocean County. But before we introduce our speakers, <laughs> I would just like to remind you that while all our programming is free, you can always support the Historical Society with donations on our website at oceancountyhistory.org. We've got some other fine programming coming up as well tomorrow, actually, which is Sunday, May 1st at 2 p.m. You can join us either in person or on Zoom for Black Baseball in America in the era of the color line. Dr. Lawrence Hogan, formerly a professor at Union County College in New Jersey, will demonstrate why he has been called a national treasure by the official historian of Major League Baseball, John Thorne, author of The Forgotten History of African American Baseball, Dr. Hogan will be accompanied by poet, playwright, and performer Kevin Kane, who will perform his poem, Breaking the Line with the Mudville Nine. So if you're interested in registering for that program, either in person or on Zoom, you can stop at the desk upstairs on your way out. Or again, check our website, oceancountyhistory.org. And then <laughs> our next program after that will be on June 12th, when we invite you to join us is Dr. Jeff Schenker, who's actually the president of the Ocean County Historical Society, discusses the individual heroes of June 6, 1944, D-Day, and what led to an Allied victory during World War II. So again, register upstairs at the desk or at oceancountyhistory.org. Okay, so let me then introduce our speakers for today. We have Sandra Blaine Snow and Tanara Hall from Ocean County Solid Waste Management and Master Composters to learn about composting and gardening in Ocean County. As advocates for the environment, they oversee the county's public outreach and education on all aspects of recycling, composting, gardening, and sustainability issues. As they told you while we were waiting to get started, you won't be spending too much time here in the exhibit hall because we get outside in the sunshine before you know it. Okay, so to a round of applause for our speaker. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, I would also like to just say we do have uh, two other master composters with us today who will be observing. We have Irene and Heidi, those wonderful volunteers. You may have met them on the way in, uh, handing some stuff out. Uh, you have the Ocean County Recycling Guide, and that has information not just about composting, but all the programs that are available for free to county residents. And you also have the bookmark with the little leaf on it. That leaf is embedded with wildflower seeds. You can plant that, feel free to color the bookmark and use it. And now without further ado, uh, we will discuss composting, or as we like to call it, uh, your grandparents did it and so can you. So uh, it's been around forever. You do not need an advanced degree to do it. In fact, anyone can do it, small children to uh, seniors. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the history of Ocean County and composting. It will be brief. Tanara and I tend to tag team one another here. So uh, let's talk a little bit about where we are here. Okay, so this is our outline for today. Uh, we're just gonna cover, as I said, a little bit of history on composting. One slide, because I know everyone loves history. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Ocean County. Um, how many of you are lifelong residents of Ocean County? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, two, two, two. Uh, how many have just recently moved here? All right, and everybody else is in between. So good, we have a good mix of people. 
Uh, also, um, I want to talk a little bit about the museum. Uh, Melissa did a great job letting you know about uh, the events that are coming up, but you are in a very special place, as you can tell from looking around. They have an incredible display, an incredible wealth of information, and a group of dedicated volunteers work tirelessly to make this available to the public. Uh, then we're going to move on to the nuts and bolts of composting what it is, why we want to do it, how to do it. Uh, not that you will ever have any problems, but troubleshooting in case you encounter an issue. And then we'll talk about how to use it in your garden. So composting is basically a traditional agricultural practice that has been done for eons to improve soil. The Lenny Lenape, as we know, they were a native tribe here before uh, the Europeans showed up. They actually taught the pilgrims how to do trench composting. And if you're wondering what that is, that is the most basic, simple form of composting you can do. As the name implies, you dig a trench, you'll take organic materials, you'll throw it in the trench, you'll cover it up with soil, and a year later you'll come back and it will have improved that soil. That's about as basic as it gets. Now, in the 1700s, as you can see, George Washington, he was an avid composter, as was uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson. There is a lot of uh, uh, correspondence between the two of them, talking about their farming, their, their composting. And if you do go to Mount Vernon, you can see George Washington's compost bins. Uh, you can see his um, where they put all the animal manure, which they used on the fields. It's wonderful. Don't do it in July. Like I did. Now, all of these, um, all these generations were composting. It was just that's what you did. What did you do with your waste? You used it to make a good soil amendment. In the 1800s, nitrogen fertilizer came into being. Think about some of the products that maybe some of you are using in your garden. You go to a local hardware store, or Lowe's, or Home Depot, and you pick up a bag of something with mystery numbers on it. That's a basic nitrogen-based fertilizer. A German scientist in the 1840s in, uh, came to realize that plants use nitrogen. So nitrogen fertilizer starts to replace composting. It's quick, it's clean, it's easy, it's fast. You get super quick results. But people started to realize as time moved on, we get to the early 1900s, people started to realize that just applying fertilizer was not a good practice. Soil is a living being. Okay, you have to feed it, you have to take care of it. Think of it like a child. Only after 18 years, hopefully, your child moves out. Okay, Sir Albert Howard, uh, he is an Englishman who spent a lot of time in India. He studied agricultural practices there. He came up with what's known as the Indori method of composting. That method of composting is still taught today to the Peace Corps. When you become a Peace Corps volunteer, that's one of the first skills that you're going to learn before you go out and work with other uh, other people in other countries, other cultures. Um, I call the Indori method the lasagna method of composting. So it's basically layering ground materials, green materials, and you keep going. So very important. Another gentleman, very important during the 1900s, was George Washington Carver. Okay, and I just wanted to spill one myth about him. You probably all know him as the peanut guy. Okay, he did not invent peanut butter. We all know it was Mr. Peanut who invented that. Okay, <laughs> but George Washington Carver um, was a prominent African American scientist and uh, agriculturalist. He had many inventions. Um, and he also proposed the importance of, and this was also known to Jefferson and Washington, the importance of crop rotation and composting. Does anyone know what crop rotation is? Yes, that's it. Uh, planting different varieties of crops so you don't know, put the nutrients in the soil. Thank you. Yes, that's that's it in a nutshell. And typically, uh, if you were a serious farmer, you would have so many fields, you would plant all of your fields, but maybe one or two you would let sit fallow, which was basically empty. Uh, because if you're planting the same crop over and over again, a lot of problems we have nowadays, you may have heard of monoculture. Monoculture is very bad for the environment. That means you just plant all of the same thing. So planting different types of crops, rotating the crops in the field so that you're not planting corn every year in the same field. Or tomatoes, plants that are heavy feeders, 
and deplete the soil. And sometimes they will put up clover mm -hmm. just to get the nitrogen back into the soil. Yes. They are letting it get now is right, covered crops, very important. And that was another thing that he advocated. So by the 1960s, J.I. Rodale comes along and he starts to propose the importance of the organic movement, organic farming, getting away from the pesticides, the herbicides that are becoming very prevalent in the 60s. Uh, we think of the 60s as free love and you know, love Mother Earth, but there was a lot going wrong with the environment in the 60s, and that's how we got to Earth Day in 1970. J.I. Rodell wanted to prove to people that you could do organic farming on a large scale basis. It wasn't just for little hippies in a commune with a few acres. Uh, so if you know, have any of you read books or magazines, Rodale Press, Okay, it's a huge, yeah, they do a lot of publications. Uh, does anyone know what else Rodale was famous for? Kind of a fun fact here. He's known for dropping dead on live television. <laughs> That's what he's known for. So one of those little crazy fun facts we like to throw in there. <laughs> he was being interviewed, and the interviewer, whose name is eluding me right now, asked him, Mr. Rodell, Mr. Rodell, I see we are boring you. And after a while of silence, they realized he wasn't sleeping. <laughs> so in the 1980s, we have a lovely lady by the name of Mary Applehawk. I would love to have that name. And she advocated worm bin composting. Kent, there's a worm bin in this room right now. Um, she wrote a book called Worms Eat My Garbage. She wanted to make it funny. She wanted to make it accessible to people. And she wanted to take away the fear that people had about having worms in their home. Okay. And now here we are in the 2000s. I can tell you composting has become very high tech. Uh, there's all sorts of composters. If you're not composting outside, there's indoor ones that you can do. Um, you can plug them in and they make compost for you overnight. Um, it probably costs about four hundred dollars, but they make compost fast. So, since some of you are lifelong residents of Ocean County, you may know this. Some of you who are newer here, we have a strong agrarian um, economy, especially in the old days. You might not notice that nowadays with all the developments. Many of those developments that you see used to be farms. So, sixteen hundreds. They're just starting to find us here. We have Captain Cornelius Hendrickson. He navigates the Barnegat Inlet and the Toms River. He's also the first person to file the coastline map for New Jersey. So we are now officially on the map, so to speak. By the 1700s, we have settlers moving in. We have small villages along the rivers here. Start uh, doing, uh, uh, we have certain products that we're producing. We have lumbering, charcoaling. Uh, we have bog ore. Also, boat building becomes very popular because we are sort of surrounded by water. So, you want to catch fish, you want to, you know, get clams, you're going to have to get out into the water. You can't always walk. All right, 1850. Does anyone know what Ocean County was called originally? Mom, thank you. Okay, we have the class pet here. <laughs> it was originally Monmouth County. If you go past the county courthouse, you'll see 1850 across the, part, the, the front part of it. That's the date at which we became a county unto ourselves. And we became the 20th out of 21 counties. So we were a little late to come to the game and have our own name. We had a whopping 10,000 residents who were living here at that time. Do you know how many residents do we have now? No. Over 600, though. Mm -hmm. All right. 1855, cranberry cultivation followed by blueberries becomes very popular. Why? We have acidic soil, and cranberries and blueberries love acid soil. So we got sandy acid soil, which they love. So now we talked about people finding us, putting us on the map. There's a few things that happened later on that really put us on the map and bring people here. Um, I don't know if any of you old timers like me would recognize this place, and I can tell you it was gone before I came along, but my husband remembers it. I know you're looking at the acne going, it's an acne, really. Um, Ocean House Hotel. 
Um, that these buildings were right in downtown Tom's River. We had a hotel, we had grocery stores, we had all sorts of little businesses in downtown Tom's River. The Ocean House built, uh, burnt down sometime. I don't remember when, but my husband came back and it was gone. And that was probably in the 1950s, 60s. Then we have our postcard here from the 1950s. I from Ocean County. We've jumped ahead 100 years from that 10,000 people. Now, as a rural county, we go from 50,000 to start growing big. Can anyone guess why we start developing so fast in 1950? Yes, please correct me, Frank. The parkway. Thank you. Mm -hmm. See this lovely green line here in 1954, the Garden State Parkway bisects the county. And as you can see, it kind of veers off to the east. Why? Because everyone in North Jersey, how many of you are originally from North Jersey here? Yep. Everyone from North Jersey wanted to come down to the shore. And they did that in the summer. And some people liked it so much, they never went back. And that's how our population started to grow. 1960s, small farms start giving away more housing developments. Anyone here remember the baby boom? Okay. Yep. Baby boomers. My husband talks about all you heard was the sound of hammering and saws when he grew up. They couldn't build high schools fast enough around here. He told me he went to every grade school. He just went to whatever they were building. So Washington Street, East Over, you name it. 1978, powers that be realized that things are developing way too fast and we need to protect something. We need to protect our land. So they create the Pine Barrens put aside all of this area. And I know if you've ever driven through it, you probably think it's sand, it's scrub pines. What's the big deal? Aquifer, our water source comes from the pine barrens. There's many endangered species that we want to keep. This is why we protect it. There you go. As Tanara said, we are now up to over 637,000 people. And counting. And counting. <laughs> So from 1950, we went from 56,000 people to over half a million people. This has had a huge impact on our land. Where did all the garbage go? Snare and I, all we do all day long is think about garbage and recycling and composting. It's all we do. We sleep, we think about it, we dream of it. So what was going on? This is the question I would think. Where is the garbage going? Well, wherever you could toss it. So if you were in your house and you were making dinner, open the window, throw it out in the yard. There's probably some farm animals that are going to eat it, pigs, chickens, things like that. The other thing is, if you look right here, bathroom, plumbing, indoor plumbing. This is the original Ocean County Utilities Authority. That building <laughs> right there with a crescent moon in it. So in the old days, we kept all our waste right on our property. What we did, we kept right there. So the other thing is, if you lived in more developed areas, um, he, he dumped it in the streets. If you're in the city, maybe North Jersey, maybe York, someplace like that, you had garbage, you open the window, you dump it out in the street. Some guy's gonna come around with a wagon eventually. If the rats don't get it, some guy's gonna pick it up in a wagon. So down here, things start getting dumped in the ocean. It's a big body of water. What could go wrong? So we also had burning. Until 19, I want to say 70, 72, you could burn your leaves, you could burn your trash. It's not really good for the environment. So we had to start coming up with a better way of doing disposal around here. Now I just want to talk briefly about this building that we are in right now. This, the Ocean County Historical Society, this building here, the Elizabeth Skullthorpe Forest House. This is a traditional. Victorian era home. The garden, which the volunteers have worked so hard on, is also a traditional Victorian garden. Very important. This house is on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, also, uh, interesting, New Jersey Women's Heritage Trail, because she was actually a trailblazer. Uh, she pioneered family education. Uh, she was an author, a lecturer. Uh, she was an avid gardener and world traveler, and you're going to see that when we go out to the garden. The other thing, uh, something you might not know, she died actually up in British Village, New York. She was very involved up there also. 
So this is a great place for us to be here today to learn more about gardening. Victorians, traditional Victorian garden. We'll go out, we'll see that. A lot of people think that Victorians were just a bunch of tight-laced, repressed individuals. We think of Freud, uh, but actually they were really innovators. They were also recyclers. They were composters, they were gardeners. They had to be recyclers. Where was it gonna go? There was no Ocean County Solid Waste Management Plan in their time. The plan was their yard. So there was a lot of progress during this era. You might not think about it. Vegetarianism started with the Victorians. Also wildlife conservation. Feminism started with it. They were actually movers and shakers for their time. Uh, their economy site, like, was very much into reuse and recycling of materials. You couldn't just go out to a store and buy something. You couldn't order it from Amazon. So you had to make stuff last. Uh, there were whole uh, businesses that revolved around this, be it ragmen who gathered rags up. And then also everything that you had, every waste that you had, you had to make something out of it. One thing, night soil. That was very important. If we remember the Ocean County Utilities Authority, the little brown building with the crescent moon in it, that's, that's night soil. That's what we're talking about, human waste, okay? So, but they also loved plants. They loved travel, they loved in, in innovation. So you will see native plants, but you will also see a lot of non-natives because they love to bring plants back from other, um, other countries. Here's an interesting fact. If you went over to Europe, you would find more native American plants in Europe than you would find back here. European gardens would have an American garden. Native plants didn't become a big thing again until later. Europeans love some of the stuff. So, and also because there was more free time because of the industrial revolution, the movements, um, people had more time to garden and it was more readily available to everyone. It used to be just for the rich. So now those of us in the middle class could enjoy it too. If you go outside, this is the garden in summer. You'll see it, we're in spring, so it's still working, it's coming up. You know, we got plants that haven't bloomed yet. But you will see that the design here, on, on the one side, they came in a variety of forms, but mostly they were circles with pathways. And there was usually some little piece of garden sculpture to capture your attention. And you'll see that they love uh, vibrant bedding plants, they love circular islands, and they were generally placed in amongst a nice, lush, green lawn. They also had lawn mowers funny, because before that you used sheep on your lawn. <laughs> so, um, as you can see, there are going to be certain elements when we get out to the garden. Take a look around, see what they have tried to recreate. You're, you're going to see arbors, trellises. There's a lovely little place that we like to have our lunch. We work in a government building in a little beige cubicle. The thing that we love is to come out and sit over here in their garden and have our lunch. People like to spend time. They've only had time to spend in their garden. But look at some of the beautiful beds. These will come up in the summer, you will see Menarda, you'll see cone flowers. These are native plants. It's beautiful. Please come back in the summer and see this place. Also, Victorians recognized the importance of pollinators. Without pollinators, we do not have food. So it's very important that we have those and that we plant plants that will attract them. Composting, Panera, yeah, take charge. So what can we learn from our grandparents? and you know people before them um just remember that before we, you didn't have that many <coughs> ways like plastic and all of those because plastic did not exist so it was easier to just get rid of your you know regular trash being organic material in your garden now we have to separate all of these items you know we recycle we throw some things in the trash that cannot be recycled but we can still salvage these amazing green material and put it back in our garden to take this away so we don't want to waste it we want to make it black gold so what is compost is literally just recycle organic matter uh, we're just recreating what nature does nothing new or crazy uh, and it's going to look like a dark crumbly earthy smelling soil like material so this is an example to doesn't smell right 
It looks great. And that is alive. You have a lot of microbes in there. Um, compost is not dirt. And you can see that that does not look like dirt at all. Uh, it's full of important nutrients and micronutrients. I would like to tell the little guys that compost is just like the vitamins for the plant. It just brings nutrients into the soil. It's just a natural process of decomposition and it's also a hummus rich soil amendment. And it's just gonna, you know, do good for your plant. It's also gonna do good for the environment because you're gonna take that away from the landfill and avoid uh, creating methane gas. So why should you compost? Our parents, our grandparents live in green. Americans, well, we still use a lot of chemical fertilizers every year. Everybody loves lawns for some reason. Um, and by composting, you can reduce fertilizer and pesticide use. Um, compost have a lot of microorganisms that will fight diseases in, you know, from your plants. So you're gonna need less of all of those chemicals that are not gonna, you know, go anywhere. They're always gonna stay somewhere on this earth, and they're just gonna harm, you know, the plants and. You want to talk about your favorite word, your transportation. <laughs> um, so when you're using compost, you're going to avoid using a fertilizer that are, just, you know, when you put fertilizers on your garden, they're just going to run with the water when it rains. And that's called runoff. And they're just going to go into your waterways. So this picture right here. That's not grass. That's not grass. That's, that's just algae. Okay. On a leaf. And that's not good. Because once that happens, you're going to deplete um the water from oxygen and you're going to have all the algae grow and grow and grow you're not going to get any sunlight and that's just not going to be any good for any of the living beings on the water so the more fertilizer you use the more this is going to happen and this happens in motion um there are so many pictures of online if you if you look it up uh, for the burning of day right that was yes. the there, there's the, dead zones. The dead zones, that's what they call. Yeah. Well, all the per, uh, fertilizers. And just remember that a big percentage of your household waste is organic, unless you hate fruits and vegetables, and probably won't <laughs> be that one. Uh, and you have all your garden waste if you garden. You're going to have a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, so every time you compost, you're just going to reduce the amount of garbage that goes here to the landfill. And you're going to reduce a lot of carbon emissions. So now we're going to teach you how to make compost, just the theory, and then we're going to go outside and then we'll, you know, put it in. So what you need is to select the right tools, equipment, and location. Uh, you're going to gather organic materials. Uh, I'll just let you on side, but we have some. This is from our office. We actually we compost at home, but we, so you get, you know, Pieces of peppers. You got some of your like coffee grounds. Filter. And we're gonna go more into it as we well. see. But I mean, you can just keep it nice and tidy in your home, and, and nothing will happen. Um, you're gonna have the perfect mix of material, and you're always gonna cover your green material with your brown. We're gonna go more into these um, in other. Uh, uh, just keep in mind the thing that you should never add to your compost. If you don't want something to um, decompose the wrong way and start stinking up uh, the whole pile, don't put it there. And if you, if you don't want something to grow from your compost bin, don't put it there. Um, also, just remember you have to churn and add water and be patient because this will take from one to two years. Now, you gotta find a perfect size and location for your compost bed if you're going to use an outdoor bedroom. Uh, we always recommend to have a pile that is three by three by three. And the reason why is because if it's too small, it might not do anything. Or um, and if it's too big, it could also not be done. Yeah, it, it's too hard. If it's too small, you're not going to get to heat up. And if it's too large, it's difficult to deal with it. So. But we just came up with these locations. Mm -hmm. For your compost bin, uh, remember to be close to your kitchen and garden just to make it easier for you to remember to put the things there. 
So if it's a hassle, you might not want to do it. Uh, you need a water source in case it dries up. You know, you have a hose. If you want to use a, you know, bucket or anything else, that's fine. Uh, but if it's still dry, then you can just add water right away. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important to put it on bare soil. In sun or shade is fine. Uh, but bare soil because you want all the microbes and all the little insects to come from the soil. Um, for the story, we have a demonstration garden and they put the <laughs> that was 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they put the, all the compost bins on top of papers. Oh, and that's the only place that they put papers, right? <laughs> well, everything else. Not the pathways where the weeds are coming up, just where the compost bins are. Um, and just, you know, you can just put it away from trees and shrubs because they're going to try to find a way to, you know, the nutrients. So you might get some roots in there. But you, to avoid that, you just put it a little more. Oh, this will be the perfect location in a setting like this. And so now the tools and equipment. Uh, all you need is a compost pail. You can use, you know, one that you can buy from the store, but you can use something you have. Maybe the those coffee um, bins. What is it? Different? Oh, I well, I just have an old Maxwell House can. Folders. It can be any brand. It's plastic. It has a lid. It's nice to have a lid. Um, and I just use that over and over again. It could be like a pretty ceramic container. Some people have those. They have uh, stainless steel ones mm -hmm. too. And now you can find them everywhere, including Target and many stores. Uh, then you're gonna have, you know, select a compost bin. We're gonna show you a different one so you can choose from. Um, you need a pitchfork just to move it and turn it. Uh, this is just an accessory. You don't have to have one, but you can check the temperature of the pile and make sure it's you know heating up to a desirable temperature or if it, nothing is happening then you can fix it um well just to get it out of there you can have a little barrel and a compost sifter just to make it look beautiful and it will be like a mark marcus to work kind of <laughs> and you don't have to have it mm -hmm. but it's, it's just an accessory mm -hmm. now these are just some type of outdoor compost bins um so you can buy something like this and you can also do it yourself. Uh, this is nice because you can start here and then once that's all ready, you can turn it into here and then put new material here. And so, you know, then turn this here, just, just to move it, make it easier. And you're gonna fit a lot of material there. Then we have the earth machine. It's nice because you can cover everything. So if you're afraid of any, mice or any other creator coming into your pile, you know, there's no way they're going to get in there. Um, and you'll have a little door at the bottom where you can harvest your compost once it's done. And it's so nice when you open that lid and you see it all finished. That's <laughs> and then we have the geoven, and this is a softer plastic and you can change the size. You can make it small or you can make it really large. Um, is good for um, filing the, your your leaves from you know the bowl, uh, but you can also use it as an outdoor composter. Um, if you make sure that you cover whatever green material you put in there, you're not going to have any problem with what and so in. And then you have some new bins like this one. Those are smaller bins and they're easy to turn. If you have any mobility problems, that might be a good one. Um, the one thing is they're really small, so you are not gonna have that much space to you know compost if you produce a lot of organic waste. And then if you don't have the space outside, but you, you still want to compost, you can do an indoor compost bin. The trick here, in most of these, you need worms. So if you don't like worms, then that might be a problem. <laughs> and um, so this is a little one. I know that's on top of um, my desk. It's really small, and I think that will be just for fun. Yeah, and just to put a little bit of organic waste because you're not going to produce that much. But you can have a plant there, and that will definitely help the plant grow better. Uh, then you have sour sour bins, um, and those are fun because uh, I don't know how much is there. Maybe a good one. The compost probably more with that one. You, you put fresh material in uh, the first tray and it gets broken down, and you'll see the little spout at the bottom. That's for any leaf shape. That's liquid stuff that would drip out. And then it's all broken down on the bottom, and you take that tray out and you harvest that compost, and then you put it on the top, 
and start adding more fresh materials to that. Yeah, well, really, they usually you leave the last one empty mm -hmm. and you start on the second one. Ah, and then they migrate up. Yeah, so that's oh, good. Well, you just yeah. gotta use them. Yeah. So the first two are worm bits. They're, yes, the and first one was good. Yes, I, I just got this one. Um, and that's what they said so to leave the, this one on empty mm -hmm. and start here. And then I guess the finished compost is just going to go down. Yes, it is. Thank you. It's small, it's really attractive, small. and it's so easy. A five year old can put it together because. It, yeah, my son put it together, and honestly, it looks like a table, right? If you didn't it even I didn't even one. notice if she said, Do you see the worm bin? I was like, huh? No, I was looking at the fiddle fig tree. And they have different colors. They have a light, light one, they have black, they have blue. Yeah. What company is that? Uh, they have different. You brands. can just yeah. Google it and you will Perfect. find yeah. multiple sources for it. And then, that and then this one. is a different uh, machine. You don't use worms for this. Uh, there are two different brands. So, what you, what you do here, you put the greens, the green materials, so any food scrap that you have, and this will dehydrate it and grind it. Um, some of these, the other brand, I'm, I'm not I sure I'm the one. name of it. It's yeah. Vitamix. I it's have, from I have have one. Vitamix. Yeah. The Vitamix food cycler, but that isn't actually compost. It's it just dehydrated. They powder. call it fertilizer in all the material because it's not microbial yeah. Yeah, at all. The good thing about it is that you can dehydrate items that you cannot throw in your recycling. Uh, let's say bones and all these things. So. If we have chicken wings at home or even the shrimp tail, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to put that in my compost, but you can do it there and then you just have a powder. So you, you get that bit of that waste that way. Uh, and if you don't have a lot of space, you can still dehydrate and you know do that powder and just put it in your in your plant right away. So are you are you buying worms to put in the bottom of that? Yes. Where do you get your worms? Okay, well, like anything else in the world, you order them from the internet. <laughs> That's where you get from the internet. <laughs> don't dig them up in your yard. Don't go to the bait shop <laughs> because you need special worms. They're called okay. red wigglers. That's a whole other course for a compost. And we will, at the end, we'll have you come up and take a look at our worm bin. But um, you order worms off the internet and then you put them in the bin and you feed them some food scraps and put some newspaper in there. Yeah. And uh, they're very busy. And as you can see, uh, worms at work. Is that? That's that's my office, and look, there's our PowerPoint presentation. But that's me. Um, I had a banana that morning, so that's the worm bin. It's under my desk. Um, you can certainly do this in your house. You can put it under your sink, out in your garage, or in your basement. Uh, and no one in our office has complained. There's no smell, and no one likes worms at the office. Yeah. So if they didn't complain, right. it's because you really didn't, you know. And none of them escaped because they're happy in there. Um, yeah, so you can have it in your garage or your basement or your living room, room like I do. Um, just remember, they are not from New Jersey, so they won't survive outside. If you leave them outside in the winter, they're just going to die. So you have to keep them inside your house. You can also put them under your bed if you don't want to. <laughs> they don't make a lot of noise. <laughs> they chew very quietly and they don't snore. <laughs> under your sink, <laughs> under a desk, anyway, <laughs> except outdoors in the winter. So they will die. Yeah. Also, if you put them outside, um, yeah. even during the summer, you might have some other insects getting in there. And we don't want that to happen because the very hungry centipede. Somehow I left my worm bin out and a centipede got in and I went to put more material in there and I looked in and like, that doesn't smell so good. So I'm like digging around, where are all my worms? Oh. There were no worms. No. And this big fat centipede running around and I'm like, oh great, it was a worm <laughs> buffet. Great. Good, well fed centipede. So just keep them inside. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about the ones outside? I have one that turns outside tumbler. Mm -hmm. So I never added worms. Well, if you do, they're going to die in the winter. No, I mean, not those worms, but I mean, I know you need the worm casings, you know. Oh, so like you can just, just get a little bit of uh, soil, soil, soil and, put in. and then you have all the microbes right, there. Right, some finding worms yeah. in the soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is good. And the thing is, just, um, do we have the worm conversion? Uh, somewhere maybe it's oh the, the type of different yeah. worms. Well, I will tell you we don't um you don't want earthworms because earthworms they are burrowers yeah. so they want to go down uh -huh. deep and aerate your soil. Red wigglers are just voracious eaters who do nothing but like they live in the upper. You will find some red wigglers outdoors, 
um, but they like to live in the upper level of the um, of the soil or the compost. So they are happy there. Right. The other ones are not. No, they're not going to be happy. They want wide open spaces. So that's why we say don't grab worms from your yard and think you're going to start a worm bin with them. They'll be very mad at you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you can also create your own compost bin. You don't have to buy one. Uh, you can just use the chicken wire. You can use an old garbage can. It looks really new, but if you have a garbage can with a hole on the bottom, mm -hmm. you can perfectly use that. That'll be perfect. So you're going to get the, uh, all the insects coming up and you don't have to throw it away. Um, you can also use hay. Um, you can use pallets. You can use what is what? Those are all sorts just of, yeah, just totes and there's, you know, And this is this. This is this. Mm -hmm. yep. And just make sure if you're going to make a worm bin, it has to be dark because they don't like the light. Oh, they're real divas. They're yeah. divas. <laughs> not too cold, divas. not too hot, not too bright. <laughs> so now, what can you compost? Um, animal bedding, and Sandra will tell them, I know your dog bed. <laughs> your dog. Um, what we mean by this is if you have a hamster, that paper based bedding is fine. You can use that. Um, rabbits. Yeah, rabbits. Mm -hmm. Chickens. Anything that you can pull out, anything that's an herbivore. Um, not your dog or your cat, um, although Tanara does have a wild dog composting. Uh, What's that? Not different thing. Yeah. yeah, a doggy dooly. It's just a different thing. You can also use brush and leaves, and this is great because you don't have to buy your leaves ever again. Mm -hmm. You can just stockpile your leaves and then use them during the year, and that's, that's what I do. I have a dog cage. I have a real wider, so the cage is big. <laughs> And she doesn't need the cage anymore. So what I do is just, you know, I have it up, you know, just this way instead of like or horizontal. And I just have all my leaves there. And I have my chart is big. I have half of an acre, and I put all my leaves there. I never buy leaves. And, and then I use them during the day. And my yard is small, um, maybe 75 by 109. And my husband just blows all the leaves into the backyard in the corner. He'll like, we have a leaf back also, which will grind up the leaves. And I just leave it in the backyard and I just let it break down over time. And it improves the soil, it makes leaf mold. And like now I've, I've never bagged leaves. And we always say, don't treat your leaves like garbage. You don't want to put them in a the bag and set them at the curb like you know, garbage. Keep them in your yard. They're valuable. <laughs> and because leaves they will decompose by themselves too. You don't have to do anything to decompose leaves. Even if you're a stock plant and they will decompose. And I mean, you're not going to end up with a lot of leaves at, you know, at the beginning of the fall. Yeah. Uh, you can use. I have a question. Why do you not put fish into the composter or to the ground? Um, well, I know that's an Italian, uh, you know, thing to do. And the, um, the Native Americans did it too. Various fish for the plant. Yeah, but if you put it in the compost, you might get a lot of uh, critters trying to get there because they, you know, they get the smell of the fish, and that's not going to decompose as quick as the veggies. Um, <coughs> well, we just want to be when you first start composting. If you haven't done it before, we want you to be as successful as possible. So we don't want you to go, oh yeah, you know, go, go take last week's salmon and just, you know, throw it out into the compost bin. And then the next thing you know, you have like a skunk or something rooting through your compost. And you're like, I am never doing that again. We want, we, we err on the side of caution. So that's why we tell you some things like, you know, invasive plants, disease plants, or weeds. Like we, we like to, to steer clear of those because we don't want you to have a problem and then hate composting for the rest of your life. If you want to use fish in the yard mm -hmm. or garden, I would say to bury it, yeah, um, bury it, bury it in trench composting or honey holes within the garden mm -hmm. or just underneath plants that you're planting out. Or you can do a different method of <clears throat> kashi and then bury that. Have, have you done that? Have you used fish in your garden, Heidi? I, uh, yes, I did use fish, shrimp skins, mm -hmm. and stuff like that underneath my plants. Okay. But I didn't put them into the composter. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think that's it's better just to do that, just to keep it safe. Yeah, yeah. Because you can buy fish emulsion mm -hmm. and stuff, but that's yeah, that's a traditional practice. But mm -hmm. and if you have that machine that dehydrates, you know that's also great because you are getting all the you know the smell and everything out, and you can just still enjoy the nutrients in the fish. 
Yeah. And and this um, all of my samples of compost are at the Cass Island Nature Fair. So about an hour before this program began, I ran out in my backyard, I opened the door on my composter, and I scraped that out. So I tried if there were any worms, I tried to put them back because you know, mm -hmm. they, don't like they don't like to travel. Right, so you can also so use sure. coffee grounds. Yeah. They are not too acidic. Um, there will that compost will be perfect for this soil because we already have acidic soil. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use eggshells uh, if you want to mash them down be better. Uh, fruit and veggie scraps, also manure. Yeah. Well, everybody knows that's you know great for your soil. You can also add it to your compost, yeah. and that will speed up the process. But it has to be an herbivore like chickens, rabbits, not you, not your dog, not your cat. <laughs> you can also use newspaper, paper towels, uh, plants that are ready, you know. Yeah. Are ashes good for compost? Um, ashes, um, definitely not anything that was charcoal, like charcoal briquettes. No, but like you have wood, like a wood, wood stove ashes. or a fire. Okay, um, only um, in moderation, I would say, because uh, they are they can raise the pH very high, um, which is the opposite of acidic. I think we might talk about that in another slide. But the other thing is I used to have a wood stove and I would dump the ashes out like in winter because that's when you use it. And then if it rained or anything, I mean, it would literally form like concrete practically. Yeah. So you can add it, but just easy, easy does it. And you can also put tea bags. Just be careful because some tea bags are made out of plastic. Mm -hmm. So if you are not sure, maybe don't do that or just don't, you know, do something. Like that. Uh, things you absolutely don't want in your compost pile, dairy products. Um, if it didn't grow, just you know, keep it away. Uh, their products are not gonna do great in your compost pile. It's gonna make it stink, and it might attract you know critters too. Dog and cat waste. Uh, one of the specific reasons I like to tell people is because they have a lot of parasites that we can also get. Uh, and you know, we, we don't want to get that in your garden, and then you're gonna eat the vegetables. So we, you know, it's better just to keep it separately. Uh, they have options in the market. There, well, I don't know for cats. We don't have cats. Yeah, but I should investigate. <laughs> um, I have I, a cat. Yeah. Um, they have the doggy dooly, and that's a separate composter. And it's honestly just a piece of plastic with a lid. You dig a hole, and you're just making a septic tank for your dog poop. You have to put bacteria every two weeks, so you don't have to bag your dog poop and. Um, and also it doesn't smell. If you keep it, you know, with the bacteria and you make a, a, a hole big enough, um, yeah, that'll be fine. Uh, meat and bones, no good either. Same with the fats, grease, and oils. That's not gonna be beneficial, just keep it separate. Uh, fish, again, you can bury it. That will be a better method. Um, disease plants, but they had a disease. So you don't want that to be transferred to your compost pile and into your plants. And invasive plants, well, they will love it there. We have all the nutrients. So you're just going to get them to grow even more in that. We don't want that. <laughs> um, and weeds, if they have seeds, guess what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. They're going to blow into another beautiful weed that you don't want. And see, the thing is, when we talked about the temperature probe and the compost heating up, it is actually like cooking. Um, it creates heat. But most of you probably won't be composting in a manner like hot composting. You have to hit about 140, 150, basically, to kill off any weed seeds and, and pathogens. So the large scale composting that we do at our recycling center, it's going to hit that temperature on a regular basis and kill off the pathogens. But for most of you, you'll probably do cold composting. So that stuff can survive it. So that's why we say don't put it in. Yeah, question. In reference to the weeds and the, the brush and leaves and then the weeds. Yeah. So in my yard I have holly trees, the holly leaves. They last that, forever and they hurt. That's not good, right? No, holly leaves are fine. Oh, because they're not really decomposing. They just and, take a long and time. And then pine needles. They take a long time. Broadleaf evergreens, magnolias, rhodes, things like that, the holly leaves. I just I, I did the ouch, ouch, ouch a few times gathering weeds. Yeah. Day. But they can certainly go in. It's just they're going to take longer to break down. 
Um, pine needles, if you have acid loving plants like azaleas, rhodes, magnolias, and, and tallies, you can just use that as like a mulch right, around them. Yeah, they right. take a long time. You just, you know, you, you scoop out your finished compost and then it's like, oh, I have pine needles, rhodes, again. Do you, do you think that the, why is it that the municipal compost is able to get to that high temperature? Is it the regular churning and the moisture? Okay. Um, that you're doing? Yes. Um, what's the trick? Uh, <laughs> at our county recycling centers, and we also do the municipal sites that have it, um, we have what are known as windrows and windrow turners. So you will see in the back fields huge rows of leaves, and they're about like six to eight feet high, maybe 14, 14 feet wide. And this big, huge machine comes out and just kind of like rolls over it like this. It looks like something from a Transformer movie. I've seen it at the Beachwood. Uh, I have seen yes. it. Yeah, they, it's like you don't have a pile that big and that's not going to happen right. in a pile. So yeah. the fact that it is that large and the fact that they are turning it, it will heat up on its own. And the guys that do the operate, you know, the operate the equipment, Tanara and I just finished our conflict and operations certification. They know, they, they go in and regularly take temperatures. And they said, as soon as that hits 140, we know we have to turn it. And we also know that by law, we have to turn it so many times because they say so. So it's really just the volume. Do they add water when they turn or no? Yeah, it rains. If it's too dry, they will know. Yeah, but um, usually you get all the heat in the middle. So you need to add air to bring the temperatures down. Right. Sure. Yeah, we don't have the video with us, but I think on, on, okay. on our website, yeah, next time. We can show you what it actually so does. So it's the volume, really. Yeah, it's and the volume. The frequency of turning. Right, right. Okay. These guys, like, we literally go to school to learn how to like keep this. And done. you will see the piles steam. steam. Yeah, yeah. I know. I I work on hot composting. Oh, there you go. Is there a question in the back? If you want to heat your pile up and you don't have lots and lots, lawn clippings or grass clippings yes. will yes. do that. Then uh, yeah. they can really. Get very, very. You have a lot of ammonia there. Yeah. You just got, don't not too much because my not be. Yeah. It's okay. a it's green. Uh, grass is actually an excellent green source, which will help create heat. Um, the the only thing is, if you're using like the Scotts four step and you're doing pesticides and herbicides and stuff, don't don't add it to your compost. Or they used to tell us in the old days, let it sit for about two <laughs> weeks, and you know then you can add it. Because then the pesticide will be in water. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the grass and the manure are two big ones for heating up your compost pile. And just remember that if you use any um, pesticide, that's gonna kill any microorganism that you need in the compost. So if you have something that has pesticides, maybe flowers from the store, um, maybe don't put them in there because you need them alive. So one of the things is that smaller things break down faster. So you can throw in large material, but if you, you know, chop it up, and most of the stuff you're putting in from your kitchen is already, you know, banana peels, apple cores, it's already small to begin with. Um, and the other thing with leaves, like I said, my husband has a leaf vacuum, so it chops and grinds up the leaves a little more. So it's going to break down uh, faster. And basically we're talking about increased surface area. So I always say if you throw an entire watermelon into a compost pile, it will break down, but the insects can only work around that circumference. If you're chopping it and making it into smaller pieces, it gives more area for them to work on faster. And the insects have little tiny mouths. So they, they can't. What about something like pineapple? Pineapple, you can throw it in and just chop. Just chop it out. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And I know that some people, you know, really get into it and have like a specific blender <coughs> in the kitchen where they just blend down their compost and kind of put it out of the pile. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's breaking it down first. Yeah, if you want to make, if you want to get a lot of time and you know, like to do that sort of thing. You just mentioned banana peels. Are you cutting them into sections? Oh, really? oh no, if you I don't feed them to my worms. If I feed them to my worms in my worm bin, yes. If I'm throwing them in my compost pile, when we go out, you'll see the kitchen scraps that I, I gathered. So, um, you know, if you have a lot of time, it's great. But um, you don't really have to. Okay. Yeah. I, we, so you can but, just throw it the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We just don't throw a water pound. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, although they're doing like, like a good like, like a good throw, throw it might like, like splatter everywhere if you wake up. I think. So um so size to surface area, I think we're again from three. Okay. Um CN ratio. We're not gonna go into any big fancy science because I don't understand science that well. So CN ratio is just carbon to nitrogen. So the C is carbon, the N is nitrogen. So carbon is brown material, and we'll see some brown material when we go out there. Carbon materials are going to be like your leaves are the most common that we have. Uh, they, the microbes use them for energy. Uh, when we talk about high in lignin and cellulose, just it's 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 tougher to break down. Basically, um, think of it as like fiber for them. Um, they have low moisture. They're slower to break down. But the reason we keep telling you about the brown materials, aside from covering the greens and keeping critters out, is you want to you know you don't want to have a smell. So and if you use the right ratio you will be fine. And the thing to remember is you're always going to need more brown material than green material. So that's why you want to save your leaves. But you can certainly use newspaper, cardboard, shredded paper. Um, the N, which is nitrogen, the green. So um, some of the materials you're going to say, but Sandra, those materials aren't just green. They come in different colors. Um, green materials are just, um, they're dense, they're wet, they're moist. Um, they're high in moisture, uh, so they're easily digested sugars and starches. So, you know, microbes, they're using that for energy and um, the protein. Yeah. And if you have too many greens, it's going to make the pile stink. But um, the one exception that we always like to say manure, a little piggy friend down there, manure is brown, but it's a green. It's very high in nitrogen. Um, I'm sorry, the young lady had to leave with her dogs, but if you have a dog, um, and you have yellow spots on your lawn, the reason you do is because the urine, be it dog or us, is high in nitrogen. So it's nitrogen burn. Oh, and I saw an, um, an article recently that they are trying to do some for investigation to see if they can just use human, you know, feet <laughs> uh, as a fertilizer. Uh, and I know there have been, you know, articles about that before, but they want to try to use it in a bigger scale. Yeah, in the UK they do it. And then also if you buy ocean grow, that's basically human waste that's been pasteurized. So, so you can take Ocean County residents. For yeah, Ocean County <laughs> residents are making ocean grow yeah. every day. All right. Um yeah, so just remember the browns are gonna be the dry materials and mm -hmm. the greens are gonna be the wet material. Uh the greens are just gonna if they just they just brought they're gonna stink. The other ones are gonna help you dry that out and keep the smell. So if you see your pile um, really dry, there's always something you can do. You have to keep it moist so that any living being you need water. Um, it needs to feel a little damp, but not soaking wet, not a soup. So just, you know, just wet it out. Uh, the composition is going to slow down if the moisture is too slow. So you might see your pile not doing anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the reason why is because you didn't do anything and didn't pull the water. <laughs> so just add the water and it's gonna, you know, get back to hopefully it will rain and you won't have to. But and the other thing is to turn it because all living creatures need moisture and they need oxygen. So that's gonna help a lot turning it. And um just one thing in the winter you might not want to turn your pile because you don't want that heat to go away. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you don't have to turn your pile every day. You know, you can do it every other week, right? Yeah. You don't want to do it in a blizzard unless you're going for hot compost. Yeah, if you're yeah. doing hot composting, then yeah, you can go out there and do it. But that requires a lot of dedication. <coughs> so, um, time and temperature, we talked about that. I apologize, my allergies are terrible. <coughs> so, that bin right there for that. So the geo, this is the geo bin, and um, so this was an experiment we did at work. Um, we are also members of the Anaheim Environmental Committee, and after Halloween and Thanksgiving, we usually collect pumpkins, you know, that you use for decoration. Um, and then the first year was pretty easy because we got maybe fifty, and we got a you know, little bit more ones. So we just composted at our homes. And it was manageable. The next year, um, it got bigger. We got a little more, but we brought some to the popcorn park too for the animals, and then we composted some at home. We were fine. 
But the next year it got bigger. <laughs> so then it got a little crazy and we didn't have a place to bring it to. Uh, so we took it to our demonstration garden at the recycling center in Lakewood. And we just did um, a special event for the two of us. And it was the smashing pumpkins. We just smashed the pumpkins and put them in the compost bin. That worked out great. Then the next year, which was last year, uh, it really got really crazy. And we got two tons of material. So obviously I couldn't do that in my house anymore. <laughs> and so we took some of our co-workers and we smashed all the pumpkins and we also got some um straw but um what did we get? No hay. No, the straw, um, right? Yeah. So we got the straw, straw and the corn, and corn sauce. sauce. So we got our green material that was you know the pumpkins, and we got the brown materials that was the hay and the corn um yeah, the corn sauce. So we just filled them to capacity. We put um, you know, first the brown and the green and the brown and the, just like a lasagna and um so it took capacity and it heat up yeah it was really great oh. well, it got some really good temperature yeah we did i think it was one week and then we went yeah. to check again and everything went down maybe from you know from up here to here where did you get where did you get the hay people donated it after halloween and thanksgiving oh yeah, but there were hay bale, like a straw bale yeah. so know. i used hay one one year um i i collected some bales actually from the beach Road recycling center because mm -hmm. people just drop mm -hmm. out stuff there. off um and it slowed everything down so much that I was, i'm never <clears throat> using hay again forget it I think that might have been treated with some sort of antifungal kind of thing. Yeah, okay. Because so, it will grow up. Well, and the difference is you don't want hay, you want straw. Yeah, so hay has, has thank you. Hay has seeds. Yeah. And yeah. straw yeah. 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 So you want straw, yeah. not hay. And I mean, the straw is like, what if you want to feed the weeds down? And I use it for my It could be that it was just way too much brown material, but there may be something on it. You might be right about that. Farmers sell it. Farmers. Yeah, so and, and that was nice because you can always keep it there mm -hmm. and stockpile for you know during the year if you don't have a lot of leaves. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're in Lavalette, you don't get any leaves pretty much, so mm -hmm. you can use that instead of leaves. So 160 is like super hot. I've yeah. never hit that temperature. Oh, I've yeah. I've maybe hit 130, 140 when I'm active okay. doing oh, a hot yeah. pile in you too. Yeah. That's um yeah, that's so th does that indicate that it's not anaerobic at that point? No, no, no. Okay. Anaerobic is more like when you've got too many greens and it's sludge. Yeah. That's okay. anaerobic means there's no oxygen. Right. So, like we work great here yeah. and then you can see the difference. Yeah, it's crazy. So it's way down. Mm -hmm. Just get rid of the next one. Okay, troubleshooting your compost. Okay. Right, so now so if you good. think it's not like too much like ammonia. Is because it's too wet, you have too much nitrogen. Um, just add brown material and you'll be good to go. Well, mix it up and then you're good. Um, it's smelling a little putrid, uh, just add browns and turn again. You need oxygen, that's because you went anaerobic and you didn't have any more oxygen. So just turn it and add browns. If you have a uh, pest, just make sure to always cover the last layer, it has to be browns. Even if you have a lid, just you know, I think it's just better just to do that. Uh, if nothing happens, you have way too many browns, mm -hmm. and yeah, leaves will decompose by themselves. But if you have cardboard or paper, mm -hmm. we know that's not gonna happen, so you need to add the grease and some water and just mix it. And when you know it's finished, well, not... so the temperature is going to drop back. One of the things that's nice about the temperature probe is it kind of tells you like it heats up, and when it hits like a a certain point and then the temperature drops back that's telling you it's time to turn it again and you'll turn it and it will probably stay about the same temperature and then it'll start heating up again so when you get to the point where even though you're turning it and it's not heating up anymore you know it's done but also the most obvious thing is to look at it and just see it you can't see any of the original materials except for corn cobs and eggshells which last forever and mango pits <laughs> and um <laughs> It's unidentifiable. It doesn't look like what you originally put in the pile. And as you can tell from having passed it around, it has an earthy, sweet smell. Okay, it doesn't smell bad. And then also it's reduced by about 30 to 50 percent. So when you start with that compost pile, if you were to do a hot pile, fill it to the top, by the time it's done, it's going to be half the size it was. It reduces in volume. 
So you can see the up close, I'm, I'm holding it right there. And you saw the you know example pass around. That's that's what it should look like when it's done. And then how to use it. <clears throat> I use, I'm not really big on mulch. I don't like the dyed mulches. I don't recommend them. Um, I like to use compost as a mulch because it's already broken down. It's fairly stable. Uh, a lot of the mulches are heavy on brown materials. So as a brown material, um, that mulch that you put down, you might see sometimes people have heavily mulched beds. Uh, some of the plants turn yellowish. It's because that brown material is looking for nitrogen. So yeah, so if you don't give it nitrogen, it's going to suck it out of the ground and take it from the plants. So, um, you know, definitely soil amendment. I use it as mulch. You can use it as a top dressing for your lawn and shrubs. Like yesterday, we were doing an event and I had like a little bit of extra, like I spilled the compost. So I just like, okay, I'm just going to shake it around on their grass. It'll make it better. Uh, you can use it to improve your lawn. You can also use it indoors. The stuff in my worm bin I use on the plants that I have in my office. Um, mix it into your soil before planting. You can always improve your soil. Uh, you can also use it for potting mix. Um, I mean, I will go out and buy a commercial potting mix, but I will add my compost to it. I'll even add a little leaf mold to it. Um, these plants absolutely love compost. In fact, I don't know a plant that doesn't like it. And then the other thing you can do is you can make something called compost tea, which is if you literally take uh, compost and you put it in a, you know, like a fabric bag yeah. and you soak it or saw, yep, soak it in water. And uh, then you can use it as a liquid fertilizer and you can put it in a spray bottle and spray it. There's like a ratio. Generally, I think it's like 10 to one, like, you know, one part compost to 10 parts water. Um, I usually just use it as like a fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to talk about yeah. the product. Well, I, I do have two it. more funny troubleshooting. Uh, sometimes <clears throat> we, we get people asking um, because they saw some bugs in their compost. Well, that's not part of the natural process. So don't be afraid of the bugs in your compost. And the other thing is if your compost is not ready, or maybe you're in a rush and you want to use it because it's bringing your planting, uh, if you put that unfinished compost in the roots of your plant, like when you're Planet, it, it's gonna burn it, so mm -hmm. maybe don't do that. You gotta let it cure and um, and just wait until it's, it's done. Uh, now we have as Ocean County residents, um, we have free products. We all we can always get free compost and free mulch from the Ocean County Recycling Centers, and our products come from your home, and they are supposed to go back to your home. Uh, every time you put the leaves on the curb or you put your brush or you take it to the recycling center, it's going to come to us. Or uh, some municipal recycling centers have the rows too, but it, it's our same operations. They, it's the same. It's our equipment and our people going out and making it on site. So we only use leaves for our compost. So there are no weeds. There are no uh, crazy plants that are going to grow. It's literally just from your leaves. That's it. Uh, our mulch is made out of your brush. So it's all local brush from Ocean County. We don't take construction waste. So you can, you know, be uh, feel safe that you don't have construction waste or pressure treated wood in our mulch because we don't use that at all. Um, also, we also test our products to make sure they're good to go. It's a requirement from the state. So even if we didn't want to, we were crazy, uh, we have to. Uh, so you can, you know, feel safe that it is tested. And this is the test, the last test from last year. Mm -hmm. Our pH, uh, well, for a yellow compost, you want between six and eight, well, five and a half to eight and a half to two. Eight. And ours is seven, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's really good. Um, well, 7.1, 7.2, right on the mark. And we didn't have any uh, trace metals, and our salts were ideal. So you don't have to feel funny about using our products because they're great quality. And we actually have to test them. Some products that you might find in the store are not. And you don't really know if they use uh, pressure treated wood in the, in the mulch. You don't want that mulch because that's not good for your garden. Um, ours is natural. Mm -hmm. And you want your garden to be natural. So that's it. And if you are a nonprofit or a school, um, community, or garden. community garden, we will do up to two deliveries per season. Uh, 10 to 20 yards of material. And to get that, you just give us. Mm -hmm. And we can arrange it. And as a resident, if you want to get it, you will have to go, you can bring buckets. If you have a pickup truck, 
uh, is a self service, and you can go there from Monday through Saturday. Um, and every all that information is in the for second guide, mm -hmm. so you can find the address and everything else. There. <clears throat> but we know a lot of people like to go out and buy stuff, and we just want people to know that even though it's free, ours is no as an excellent product. And like Tanara said. Some other places that may charge, you don't know. If they take construction waste, they could grind up old pallets or old wood. And especially with the dye, and when you dye something, well, it's not good for your plant, but you could also be hiding inferior wood. So you know when you get it from us, it, it came from your yards. It's good. Think about the Christmas tree uh, collection mm -hmm. that we do every year. Well, that's what you're going to get back to. Yeah. So, you know, you want that in your garden. And remember, you know, you are supporting and that's part of your tax money that you pay. So take advantage of that program because it's just crazy to go and buy something <clears throat> when you can get it, you know, a bit better quality. I used to live in Beachwood and I took advantage of the compost and the mulch there all the time. I moved three and a half miles away into Berkeley and the Berkeley Recycling Center isn't great because they don't have as great compost there and they don't have the mulch available. Am I still able to go to the Beachwood Center because it's awesome? <laughs> well, not as a resident. You can't go to another town, but you can always come to the Northern Recycling Center in Lakewood because that's our county facility or the Southern one in Stafford. And any resident from Ocean County can go to either one. Yeah, and usually towns request it. And I know, you know, Berkeley, um, I don't know why it would be problematic, except I know that they did have a problem with residents, like they'll pack up their cars with brush, and then they've got like concrete blocks and all sorts of stuff tucked under there, and the guys are constantly having to go there and get stuff out that people are dumping. That they did water. have a pile of compost, but when I went mm -hmm. to go and pick it up, it smelled rancid. Wow. So I didn't want to be involved. And that was like two years ago, so I don't know what the situation is now. Maybe it was just a bad time. Yeah. But yeah. Sometimes people do things they shouldn't. Yeah. yeah. That's what we've learned. Um, so anyways, uh, this program, uh, our education programs, we have won the Master Composter Program. And this past year, we did, uh, what was it, uh, recycling for, we did the vacationers. Yeah, so, <clears throat> well, yeah, so 20, 22 years ago. We, we won um, an award for well, actually, 2000, 2000. Well, we got we started in 2000. 2008. Yeah, I'm sorry. In 2008, we started in 2000 this program, and then in 2008 we won uh, the NJDE for, um, award for outstanding education program, and then 2021 we won the award again, and that was for the recycling. yeah we targeted to uh, vacationers and you know Ocean County related water activities like. You know, boaters, and when you are going, you know, to the beach, just to get everybody to understand how the Ocean County program works, and um, yeah, we're trying to come up with new ideas. So any ideas for Good programs you. are welcome. <laughs> and also, mm -hmm. this program is part of the Ocean County Master Composters. If you're really passionate about composting and you want to volunteer, we have a program in the fall that is two full days of training. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. We're gonna do a hybrid now. Um, so you might be able to take some of the classes online and then just do the hands-on, which we might, you know, wait because we already yeah. did it. Mm -hmm. But we're flexible. Right. <laughs> and then you just yeah, we'll give you the earth machine composter that the one that is enclosed, um, a pitchfork and some other goodies. Uh, and all you have to do is just volunteer. We're pretty flexible and just doing outreach. You can also do your own talks if you want. Um, and we don't, I mean, we don't, we don't have to work the master <laughs> Yeah, so, you, you know, you can freely create your own agenda for the activities. And there are things that we teach in the master compost, your class that are secret and you don't teach at work. Ooh, so you'll so find you know. out all the secrets behind <laughs> recycling. <laughs> Composting, you get to tour our recycling center, meet the friendly rats that uh, help us. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't meet them up close and personal. No, I'm only joking. But uh, the master but composter courses, it. yes, is is a, a great program. And we have two master composters over there who've done the program. They've worked events with us. They're wonderful people. They're knowledgeable. They're very giving and giving of their time. And without further ado, I think if you want to ask any questions. Okay.
I'm sensitive. I, I don't know if we have to be just talking about. Okay. But um, I live in one of the 55 Riverdale communities, oh. and they uh, 